Hello everybody, thank you for joining, oh bugger, sorted, <laughs> thanks for joining us um, everybody um, for the second part of this lawns, <laughs> this lawns, I was thinking to myself earlier like, and you know it's what makes this even worse as far as entertainment goes, just think about what we're doing here right, we've got a novel from not a writer, from you know, from not a which is there's nothing wrong with that, but you've got a novel written by a sex offender who isn't a writer. It's not even, yeah. Anyway, um, can you the creature part two? Uh, can you just guys say hello so people can hear, please? Hello, hey, guys. Right. It says like I'm giving you orders. The only reason I'm saying that is to sort of try and. Um, stave off my usual kind of shitty sort of uh, technical issues which I'm trying to sort out and uh, I've had to hook onto my own internet which is never good. I think you're good now. You're... No, well what happened was well, I stole you're, you're next door's Wi-Fi but the signal was really weak so I've had to use my own which doesn't bode well so I'm going to try and hook up to my hotspot from my mobile if it goes down because cause I live in the middle of nowhere it's kind of um, well I don't live in the middle of nowhere anyway I'm just fucking rambling shit here um, so we uh, quite a lot of people here already so thanks for joining us everybody I'm, I'm glad that you're here because it va it validates our lameness for wanting to go over this because at least people are interested in it otherwise what would be the point what <laughs> Um, we, I think both myself and Shin equally share this sentiment of gratitude towards Amanda F James, which we're going to have to mention each week for painstakingly transcribing this thing. So we do appreciate it. Thank you. She's a goddess. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm thrilled to do it. Yeah, and, and I think it's important uh, that a lot of people may not know this. And it's also related to what you were kind of saying, saying at the beginning, that this is his most unrefined piece of literature because Amanda had to transcribe this from his spoken word. And he was reading this from a notebook, I guess, scratched with uh, a scratch and pencil or something. So he never edited this like he did. <laughs> I put edit in quotes like he did with Taken Abroad. Um, so this is this most unrefined work and amanda had to sit through that uh his his first draft which is his final draft um thank you amanda and he reads very slowly which is is good in a way because i can keep up while i'm typing it but it also is fucking horrible because he's full of mini syllables and he's stumbling over everything and he he reads very monotone so it almost puts you to sleep but I'm happy to yeah. do it, you guys. It's amazing that someone as interesting as Lon is so dull. Like, it's just a strange paradox, <laughs> not really a paradox, really, that's the wrong word, but a strange kind of oddity that, um, you know, we obsess over this guy, but when you get down to it, he's quite a dull character, isn't he? Really. <laughs> it's fucking weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, well, he's... well, yeah. I mean, he, he, even his his imagination is dull. I mean, uh, this is supposed to be a work of fiction. I mean, this is like hey, dude, you've not even finished it yet. Me. Give him a chance. Wow, you judgmental yeah. asshole. <laughs> but well, I, I know it's going to get a lot better. I know that, Andrew. Um, now you've heard it here, it... guys, right? This is supposed to be like a, a an unbiased review of a piece of work, and and Shin's <laughs> judged it already. I mean, have you ever? Yeah. I mean. Talk about not giving anybody a break. I mean, who's to say? Well, that I this follow one... this author quite quite a bit, Andrew. I, I follow this author quite a bit. <laughs> yes. yes. So I, I think I'd like to call myself, a, you know, a literary expert when it comes to law. Actually, so. I'd like to approach this a little bit differently. Um, so I'm not intent on judging this as an actual novel because for a number of reasons. It doesn't mean we can't have a bit of fun. It doesn't mean that we can't point out gaping plot holes. But the thing is, like, you've got to you've got to realise the context. This isn't finished. 
So it's just a first draft scribbling. Now, we have to obviously say that it wouldn't be any different than the final version because if, if, if taking a broad as anything to go by, that didn't do very well in the editing process. Um, but he's not even had the chance, and he's not an author, he's not a writer, so judging it as an actual literally li- literary piece of work is not fur, really, if you get what I'm saying. But it doesn't... My sort of hope... Oh, the reason I find this interesting, as you've already point, pointed out, Shin, is that this is all from Lorne's brain. There's been the, he hasn't even, as, as far as we understand it, he hasn't even had a chance to to redraft it, rewrite it, to look at what he's done. It's just a stream. Well, we of, read it. Yeah, anything. It's just a re. It's just a stream of consciousness from Lorne's brain. The good thing about it is, as Shin pointed out, it's directly what. It's contained within his brain. It's like an unedited flow, like the chat log. The chat log is the same thing because that's why that document is so fascinating is that he, everything that that guy's deepest thoughts and insecurities all manifested in that chat log. You know, it is remarkable. This, I hope, would be similar but obviously you have to judge it that Lorne is trying to tell a story. Um, but the fact that already the similarities between this and taking a broader striking, it's based around a couple. They have the first day ice skating or roller skating or whatever the fuck it is. Um, and we meet his mum. That's pretty much all that's happened so far, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah that's... that's... Oh, I was I was going to say that's what's interesting is this is this book and Taken Abroad. They're kind of Lauren's ideal life minus the mm-hmm. the horror aspects or the um, the murdering aspect from Taken Abroad. The bulk of the book <laughs> is taken up with just boring, like domestic life, life between a husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend whatever he he put so much time into getting to know each other in that with zero dialogue might i add all that we've heard about him getting to know his girlfriend in this book there's very little dialogue between the two of them so you don't get any real like character development ever they're just notes they pass notes to each other they get that but they didn't say what the notes said (laughs) i know (laughs) He didn't tell us what they said. Yeah, there's lots of notes. Yeah, th- that's what's interesting. It's, it's like a peek inside Lauren's mind and how he wishes his life was, I think. I think he wishes that his mother left him notes to find out about his dates. He wishes that, you know, he had this high school sweetheart that he went on to, um, you know, be with yeah. forever. Yeah. I, I can't agree with you more on that. But I also would add that this is a guy who is looking uh, inside from the outside. He doesn't know how normal people are. He's a social pariah everywhere he goes. I mean, whether it be on a a, a lower level where just amongst friends, he doesn't have any friends, or goes shopping in Walmart. People probably stay clear of him. So, but he, so since he doesn't have the the, the ability to, to draw from these experiences and what happens to normal people in real life, he has to, things up he has to embellish things on what he thinks it's like it's uh what's wrong with this guy that's why the dialogue is so lacking he doesn't know how to talk to people that's why it sounds so unnatural and strange whenever the care with each other it's like he's never talked to anybody before <laughs> yeah exactly or it's weird <clears throat> but you would think if you could create a fantasy for yourself would be a hell of a lot better than what he writes about. Well, that's just his lack of imagination, like you said, isn't it? He's not... And I think an imagination is... is, It can be like a muscle, really. You you need to train it in some ways. I think you've either naturally got a good imagination. You know, some people are suited to writing fiction. Um, The problem is with Lorne, he doesn't specialise in anything. He doesn't like audio cutting in and out. Yeah, sorry, guys. Um... Mm. Well, I, I would love if he if he wrote about a fiction about the main character being a country music star. I'd like to see what he think that's all about. You know that's how that 
how that character, uh, what that character's reality is. It's a good point. He can write about that. He knows something about it. Are we, are we still on? Yeah, we're still on. It's, it's, um, the audio's cutting in and out, but I don't know. Shockingly, I don't know what to do about it because we're connected as we normally are. Is it all of our audio or just yours? Well, to be honest, I can hear you guys cutting out. Um, I, I can't, obviously. Yeah. Can... Oh. I hear it a little bit, but it's not so bad that I can't understand you. Yeah, yeah. everybody says it seems to be good now. Yeah, look, I, think, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's bad in that it's going to create a massive problem. Um, but yeah, I think the imagination part obviously doesn't have a great one. Um, but I, it's bizarre because you kind of, if you look at the lawsuit, you'd say, fuck me, this guy has got a crazy imagination. But it's it doesn't come from his imagination. Well, actually, if you think about it, think about this, right? And we're going off a little bit here. Uh, when he's writing that lawsuit about female powers and all that nonsense, it's kind of like if that was creative, it'd be genius, wouldn't it? If that if that was a work of fiction, you'd be like, wow, this is this is this is some hot stuff. You know what I mean? But. Um, it's like his it's like brain. Legal pleading, though. <laughs> well, his brain thinks of all these crazy things to to write in his lawsuit, and the crazy tales he tells to get out of bit sticky situations. Like, my memory's not that great, you know. These crazy excuses. You're thinking there is something in there. Like, is that imagination? I'm I'm trying to kind of understand that really. But I suppose when he's trying, he can't think of anything. I get what you mean. He he goes through some mental gymnastics to um, always make himself the victim or the hero. And I guess you need to have an imagination to do that. But yeah, I think he does that. Right? I, I think one of the reasons why he likes... Uh... <clears throat> Well, he's always saying, I love you, I love you to the catfish, aside from the fact that he's got nothing else to say, or I can't wait to be with you. It's because I think he fantasizes in his mind, I mean, taking the catfish out of the equation, just walks around thinking, I wish I could say this to someone else. And he may even utter it out loud once in a while. That's why he likes the catfish, because he could actually, he has an outlet for it. You, you know, know um, um... so I think the same, same thing with this book. I mean, he has all these fantasies going on in his mind. This is just his aspirations and his, you know, um, what he thinks a perfect world is. Um, uh, Lee Greer, FBI, although I know that's said backwards, um, has just said he fantasizes about the most boring aspects of human life, eating breakfast, cleaning his vehicle, etc. I was just kind of wondering, right. is that because he fantasizes just... about just having a normal domestic life? Is something he hasn't really had? There's always been problems, hasn't there? If you think about it throughout his life, he obviously longs for this relationship, which is, you know, goes without saying, doesn't it? Um, is it that this domestic, boring, mundane life is something that he craves for and that's why it comes out in his scribblings? I think he has that. I think he had that. There were a lot of people who were a lot worse off than he was growing up. I mean, yeah, but the, the domestic life for him is with a partner. And his writings yes. are all based oh, on that, couples. Oh, that you're talking about? Okay. I, yeah, I, I, I do totally. mean the domestic. But what I mean, what I've come to sort of realize myself is domestic life with a partner or a significant other is usually pretty fucking boring. Supermarkets, fixing vehicles, the fridge motors broke, all that bollocks. Um, but he seems to fantasize about that. It, it's kind of what he's he only fantas for. fantasizes about the good stuff, not the burdens. He only fantasizes about the romantic aspect of it. Well, no, he doesn't, does he? Why do you think his, his, his writings, I think what Lee Greer FBI was getting at, sorry, I can't even begin to pronounce it backwards, um, is that th most of the book is took up with just pointless shit. He turned the light switch into the off position. There was a spread of food, of yeah. Rice Krispie squares. It's like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Come on, I love that part. I think, do you know what <laughs> I think it is? I think that... He tries to figure out how to... He knows that in order to write a novel, you've got to be quite descriptive because you're setting the scene. But he does... I think that's why he does it. But he does it in the wrong... He does it... 
he doesn't do it in the correct aspects of the book. Like he doesn't describe Makes the, the whole characters. Book a he description. Doesn't... Yeah, he doesn't. It, the important things we don't get descriptions on, like emotions, characters, uh, scenes. But but like the mundane shit, we get plenty of. I think that's kind of what it is. That's because he's yeah. he's a slave. He's a slave to creature comforts. He's a slave to the most mundane. How many times have we talked about the pot of coffee? Is this, if it's it's some tradable commodity between him and Roy, you know, or the pizza? You know, we're having that tomorrow night. Who thinks that far ahead? about things like that um but but it, again he's a he's a slave to creature comforts and that's all he knows because he can't see past his nose yeah well it's interesting he describes the food in a lot of detail or opening a car door for his girlfriend repeatedly but Several we have no times. idea what the characters look like no idea no. i don't think we even know their exact ages we just know that they are seniors in high school. Mm, yeah, we never we never get that kind of really important information, do we? Um, anyway, um, shall we? Um, shall Must we make we? a start? <laughs> Sorry. Should we, make, should we make a start and um, maybe we can um, get cracking because I know we mentioned it earlier, <laughs> chapter three. Um, as we kind of understand it, goes on for quite a bit. So I can't remember anything else that happened other than they meet in class. She asked him out. Sorry, he asked her out. He's wanted to ask her out for ages, but never had the balls. He finally has. They went on a date. They kissed, if I remember correctly, and that was it. Oh, and she's met his mum. Yeah, they've met each other's families, right? They've spent the holidays together. We got to that oh, part. We don't get point, anything. She gets a mom in the one. Yeah, she has a family too. Her mom is special. We get some description of, of her mother this time. She has a softness about her. And she, when she talks to you, it feels like she really cares about your future. And she wears an apron while she cooks. <laughs> That's beautiful. So I think we left off at the... Um, Oh, did we? I don't want to give it away if we didn't. Right, well, don't say anything then, because we certainly don't want spoilers. Because we want the. I don't. Did no, we get to the part where he, he 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 had been something. working at the grocery store after school or something? Did we get to that part? I don't remember that. But that's well, not to say. I don't it. remember. Okay. Well, is this right where we left off last week? If I got it correct. It is now. If I got it correct, then yes. Okay. This is where we left off. So this was right, like well, halfway I'll... in chapter two, as I understand it. Okay, well, it's Valentine's Day then. Yeah, do we remember that? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember that. Okay. Right, okay. Um, 66 <laughs> people in the chat. Dum, dum. So, um, yeah, let's get going, shall we? Uh, so, I'll read the first bit. It was six in the evening and Samuel was walking up to the door to Jennifer's house. He was wearing cream-coloured dress pants, a light br blue long-sleeved dress shirt with a cream-coloured tie with the red and blue stripes going at one angle on it. At least we get in descriptions of the clothes. He had a single red rose he had bought for Jennifer in his sweaty and shaky hand. Right, okay. So he's doing all right here. He's describing mood. He's setting a little bit of a scene. As he approached the door, he reached his hand out to ring the doorbell. Before he, But before he could, Jennifer had opened the door. She looked so beautiful. All Samuel could do was stare at her, stalker. His mouth wanted to move to tell her how beautiful she looked, but no words would come out. She bent in and gave him a kiss, and it brought him out of his trance state that he was in. You don't have to say anything. I see it on your face when you look at me, Jennifer explained. As she sm <laughs> what? What the fuck? So she knows. Hang on a minute. So that she's he's, beautiful. Uh, do you know what? Yeah. Right. I was actually... And I'm sure that if I'm going down the wrong track, Amanda James will quite put me in my place here. But that wasn't bad, that first bit. 
I think he did quite a good job of explaining. You know, he was setting the scene. He was explaining reasonably well for him that sh- that he was nervous and that words wouldn't come out. So he, you know. But this kind of, like, nullifies any of that. You don't have to say anything. I see it on your face. That's not something someone would say. That's, like, kind of arrogant, isn't it? I know Absolutely. you think I'm beautiful. It is. It is. Yes. It is. What, if, what, if, what if Samuel said, I was going to say there's something on your nose right there. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm yeah, kind of, it doesn't, it's not very, it's just not, I mean, you don't have to say anything. I see it on your face when you look at me, Jennifer explained as she smiled and blushed. Samuel smiled back and handed her the rose. What exactly does Jennifer see on his face? Yeah, is he just standing there with his mouth wide open? <laughs> <laughs> Drooling like Homer Simpson does. <laughs> you know, it's funny, though. We get a description of his clothing choice for the night, but all we know is that Jennifer looks so beautiful that all he could do is stare at her. We don't know what she's wearing. Yeah, so she's completely so awesome. naked because if, if Aaron, Aaron, if Samuel is anything like Lon, that's pretty much what would make him do that. This, this is also a reflection of what Lauren believes that he, he thinks that, um, you know, he could presume what other people are feeling and thinking. That's what he did yeah. with Kayla, the entire chat log. You don't have to say a word. I know what you're thinking. You think I'm hot. You think I'm handsome. No, no, no. You don't have to say it. Good point. Interesting. Interesting. Um, he took her hand and walked her to the car. As he opened the door for her for her to let her in the car, he whispered in her ear, Again. Oh, beautiful. Fucking hell. He gave her a kiss oh, on man, the cheek. Amanda, you keep track? What's up? Are you keeping track of the amount of times he's opening the door for her? No, I definitely lost count, but it's constant. He wants the reader to know that Samuel opens the door for his teenage girlfriend every time she gets in or out of the car. That's what a gentleman does. When they arrived at the fancy restaurant, Samuel walked over to the other side of the car to open the door for Jennifer. There we go again. (laughs) We should have a counter. After she was out of the car, he told her that he had forgotten his wallet, his wallet, in the glove compartment and had to get it. She waited. That sounds like Lord all over that, doesn't it? <laughs> what a pain. Yeah. Oh, I forgot my wallet. You're going to have to pay, Jennifer. <laughs> he told her that he'd forgotten it. She waited there for him as he reached into the glove compartment and cautiously slipped the engagement ring into his pocket with that. What? Fuck me well, this yeah, quick. Yeah, this is moving fast, man. This is moving fast. This is long well, all over this. At the end of at where we left off last week, I thought we had established that he had been working at a grocery store after school and had been saving up his money so he could buy her an engagement ring for to give to her on Valentine's Day at a fancy restaurant. Oh. Engagement? I don't know if we read that part oh. last week. They were in high school? Okay. Uh, I don't think it matters, Amanda. They've been dating since. So they started dating on the first day of school in September, and now it's Valentine's Day, and it's time to propose. That's like what? And we're seniors in high school. More than half a year. So his well, mouth is still gaping open when he's Yeah, chooses. but in Lawn's world, that's quite a long time to wait to fucking propose. Yeah, but they're Holy kids. Shit. Oh, yeah, of course, but I'm just saying, you know, it's probably a long time in Lorne's world. He pretty much does it straight away, doesn't he? Um, mm-hmm. They walked into the restaurant hand in hand and were seated at a quiet corner table for two. They ordered their dinners and the waiter lit the single candle that was placed in the centre of the table. They began talking as they waited for their meal to be delivered to their table. What, what do you want for the future? Oh, here we go. What? Hmm? No. No, go ahead. Like, okay. what, they always gloss. He always glosses over the conversation. So here it comes. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, what, sorry, what do you want for the future? Samuel asked Jennifer as his hand reached for hers. I've learned from my parents, Jennifer replied, that there's nothing more important in life than having someone in it that will always be there for you and will always be your best friend. Oh, this is 
fucking torturous. The, Always be the, your best friend, no matter what the situation is. <laughs> In a reasonable what, situation. <laughs> what the situation is that you find yourself in. What my parents have together is what... What a load of bollocks that is. I, I mean... Rolled just, my eyes so hard uh, when I heard that. That is the... Stu- what teenage girl says, my parents are so in love, and that's what I want. I want to be in love like my parents. And again, this is a kid. She. What do you want for the future? I just want to marry someone. That's all I want. You don't want to go to college. You don't want to, I don't know, travel the world. You don't want to go get drunk like normal, like high right. school seniors. Right. No, I just want to be you in want to love. Make money. I want to mate for mm-hmm. life. That's what I want. I want to nest. Because I learned from my parents Oh. I mean, as if as if the question itself wasn't fucking stupid enough to begin with. What do you want for your future? Um, I'm, you know, like, I'm hung just... up on that. Sorry. No, it's all right, dude. The the single candle. I'm hung up on. The, the, dude, I, dude, I, that's I'm the met, least of this I, passage's problems. I, I I know, but yeah, I have to, I guess, de-escalate the situation here a little bit. But <laughs> nah. The single. I, I wonder what Lauren envisions is in his mind with a candle look like would it be a candlestick with a candle sticking up or would it be what, what you see in restaurants you know in those uh, crystal things or whatever um, i doubt he just his idea the way he describes things it's, it's so unfamiliar everything's like from a tv show or a movie a cheesy movie nothing comes from real world experience certainly not this dialogue it this is like what he wants in a, in a woman he wants a, a young girl who just wants to settle down and be a wife immediately and have no independent plans for her future yeah, i mean that's what he cheat. said mm. all i want is is one person to love and the way it's worded is horrible there's yeah, nothing more always imp- be your best friend no matter what the shit can you imagine Right, if you was on a date and the other person said that, you would run a fucking mile, wouldn't you? You'd be like... Certainly, if you're in high school. This is like her it, first boyfriend. You you can't help but think it, of anything else but the sting when he says, no matter what the situation is that you find yourself in. <laughs> There's nothing else you can <laughs> you think of. You ever get busted for trying to screw a 13-year-old. Don't run off. Yeah, that's true, because in Lauren's mind, if you love someone, you're going to stick by them through everything, no matter he what He even it is. says that in some of the calls, doesn't he, when um, Tiffany was talking to him and mentioned the, uh, when he says, oh, my, some of my per- uh, uh, brothers and sisters don't want to speak to me anymore, it's, you know, and he kind of, I mean, you can understand someone not thinking fondly of the siblings in that situation, but... He doesn't think that he thinks he's been betrayed, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he yeah. says, it, Tiffany said, some people aren't going to want to talk to you anymore after what you've done. And he said, well, that means they never loved me to begin with. And I don't, that's... I don't think he understands the concept of irredeemable. You know, when you do something like that, and you're con- now you're constantly monitored and you're you're tagged in society as being someone who's dangerous. I don't think he understands that you know if he wasn't on the rso or, or got caught up in this thing i i can't imagine what he would be talking about if he said no matter what the situation is that you find yourself in would it well it would be much lesser offense than that i'm sure but mm. that's clearly what he's thinking in that when he's writing this i think yeah i, I um, agree um, well it's the same with relationships in his mind no matter what he does going back to Ramona he can get drunk and be verbally abusive and crazy and leave a hundred voicemails and text messages yeah that's that's pretty bad too well if you care about him you're not trying to rape a child is worse than that though (laughs) that's what I'm saying right but it's just the whole idea that if you love me then that means you owe it to me to stick by me through anything no matter what I do yeah and if you end up break up with you yeah yeah Hmm. Uh, yeah. Right, let's continue. Before Samuel could say any more, the waiters interrupted them with their meals. It's a strange way of writing it. Samuel could barely swallow his food, much less finish the whole plate, from the butterflies in his stomach of what he was about to do, even though the food was delicious. 
You've barely touched your food, Samuel, Jennifer said as she grew concerned. Are you feeling all right, she asked. Yes, I'm fine, Samuel um, answered. Then why aren't you eating your dinner, she asked. Because I have a question to ask you. It's making me nervous. Huh? It's just a circular conversation. It, just, <laughs> it is pretty it's silly, isn't it? Nothing. Um, it's so predictably cheesy, this as well. Yes. Um, the look on Jennifer's face grew with great What is it you call him? Huh? Oh, my God. This part is fucking stupid. Sorry. Is this our breakup dinner, she asked. Samuel realized that he was making her worried. So he got out of his chair, knelt down oh God, in front of her and pulled the ring out of his pocket. When Jennifer saw the engagement ring, she started to cry. As Samuel, st oh God, as Samuel started saying, "Jennifer, I love you with all my." <laughs> Will you marry me? <laughs> yes, she replied and gave Samuel a hug and a kiss after he put the ring on her finger. <laughs> Samuel was finally able to finish his what his meal after asking Jennifer the question. Well, so, as soon as they just went straight back to eating, like nothing... Yeah, they just went back. Okay, that's just strange. Well, Jennifer... He asked in the middle of eating his meal, apparently. Jennifer is not a very smart girl, because she thought that he took her out to a very fancy dinner, and they got all dressed up so he could break up with her. I don't think that's how people break up with each other. No. Well, no, no. Not okay. unless you kind of... You know, trying to get back at them for cheating or something. As you found out. Um, although, if, if anybody watches the... Oh, I'm not going to start quoting the room again. Um, when they finished their meal, Samuel paid the bill and they went to Samuel's house to watch him. Hang on a minute. They've, they've kind of skipped over the kind of marriage bit quite. You know, it's like... Will you marry me? Yes. Big hug, ring on a finger, and then they're going over to watch a movie. And that literally happens within... The next sentence. Yeah, that was the only important part. She said yes. <laughs> right, you, you, Amanda James. I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to cut. I'm, I can't read anymore. You have to give me. A, I need a break. Can you read the next bit, please? All righty. Uh, his parents were gone for the evening. They knew that they could have some time to themselves. In the middle of the movie, their closeness had grown closer to where they were laying down cuddled <laughs> Ooh, on the couch. Ooh, this is getting interesting. Teen sex upon us, guys. Written Samuel by a sex was... offender. <laughs> Samuel was barely even watching the movie because he was too busy staring at Jennifer and smiling because of his happiness in her answering yes to his question. Jennifer also was barely watching the movie because she kept staring at her new engagement ring Samuel had given what her. What are you fucking watching it for then? Samuel lowered his lip down and kissed Jennifer on the cheek. And Jennifer turned to look up at Samuel and he kissed her on the lips. The more they kept close contact with each other's lips, the harder it was for their bodies to take its natural course. What? What does that mean? Yeah. Which I don't know. Amanda understand. James quite aptly wrote, what the fuck does that even mean in brackets? I'm, I like this commentary. Oh, Thank you very nice much for that. Editor's note. I was very confused by that. For right. their bodies to take its natural... Can we read course. that again? Okay. The more they okay. kept close contact with each other's lips, the harder it was for their bodies to take its natural course. Okay, so it was harder for their bodies to do something. We don't know what it is. Does he, does he mean we that, that... He means... I, I, he's trying to say it was hard for them to resist having sex, but he worded it like a moron because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. By the way, why do we have to keep calling him? Can't at some point one of his friends or even Jennifer call him Sam? Is it Samuel? Though? Is he Amish or something? Good point. I, I don't know many people... It's just weird. Where, where would he get that name anyway? Where did he get that? Anyone Probably a, maybe someone in prison. An inmate? Yeah, that would be my guess. Um, I insisted like, on being called Samuel. Okay. The number of times he says Jennifer and Samuel, Jennifer and Samuel, Samuel opened Jennifer's door, Jennifer got out of the car. Can't you just say he and she at this point? We know who you're talking about. Yeah, because there's no fucker else. Left. There's nobody else in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Todd, okay. Todd Fisher has a great, great point. Imagine having Lauren stare at you for the duration of an entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks that's romantic. It's like when he told Kayla he stared at her picture for an hour. He thinks a woman would be flattered to, I mean, she's watching a movie. She's looking down at her new ring. She's just being normal. And you glance over and this man is just staring at you the whole time. That's creepy, Lauren. Hmm. Right. Let's proceed. All right. Before they knew it, neither one of them could fight back the love they held for each other at that moment. And neither of them wanted to. This was part of the night that wasn't planned. After giving in to the love they felt for each other, they lay there staring at each other. <laughs> Samuel would play with her hair and rub his hand across her cheek and tell her that he loved her. Jennifer would smile and say, I love you too. Oh, God, this is painful. This is painful stuff, this. I mean, oh. We got ripped off, man. We didn't get any details. We didn't get any <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Nothing. We got, I love that. We got ripped off. We stole a fucking unfinished novel from Lauren and we got ripped off. <laughs> it is I want to send it back and have me write the scene. We got moistness and taken abroad. We got her her dampness or whatever he said. We got talking about his tongue, exploring her mouth and all kinds of graphic shit. And now we, you know, we didn't get that here. They just gave in to the love that they felt for each other. <laughs> maybe even Lauren realized. Maybe I shouldn't write a graphic paragraph about two teenagers having sex that, while I'm in prison. I wanted to mention that. You know, I, I don't think probation ever, ever, um, ever kind of anticipated this happening, where they could say you stay away from other children's literature or, or, or literature or involving children writing and things like that. But I didn't think. I didn't think they could anticipate him writing about children having sex. Well, don't forget this was never released, so they'd never know about it, would they? Unless the stream inadvertently landed him in it, that would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> well, put it this way, he's not passing rape class writing shit like this, is he? Um, yeah. Should we crack on? Yeah, you want me to do it? Uh, actually, let's give Shin a go. You can write, read, sorry, the next part Dude, of, the, of chapter Something three. happens to my brain every time the words he wrote comes out of my well, mouth. Well, that, that's what we've just this. been struggling with, so it's your turn now. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to plow through. Uh, the next few weeks went by, and Samuel and Jennifer uh, were supposed to go on a hike with some friends. Jennifer hadn't been feeling good and she knew oh shit here we go and she knew why because she had already had a oh, from Jesus. her doctor Fucking she was Christ. pregnant she had told her parents but hadn't told samuel yet she planned on telling him the day on the hike the day on the hike they met up with vernon and his girlfriend holly and andrew and his girlfriend whitney at the base <laughs> of mount katahdin at eight o'clock that morning i've been there by the way i, I climbed mount katahdin. <laughs> all right before. Uh, yeah, it's right, it's, 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 and Lauren couldn't yeah, even come up with a fictional name for a mountain. He had yeah. to. Use... That's a... Sorry, it's man. a pretty cool mountain, actually. Um, they hadn't planned on cap uh, camping overnight, uh, but brought the extra supplies with them just in case. From what the forest ranger Bill Hawthorne, we get to know his name, had told them, they would be the only ones on the mountain today because not too. Excuse me, not many people go hiking in March. Okay. That's what you got to look it up. That's, I think I've hit my capacity. Okay. No, you do. Um, so he's taking her on a picnic. No, a Wait, hike. I don't get this. Picking up a mountain in a March. Okay. And she's going to, she's going to break the news that she's pregnant. Yes. On a hike in March up a snow covered mountain. And they're not planning on spending uh, the along night. with take all the okay. extra stuff just in case like tents and all that shit that's like a lot of stuff to carry just in case if you're not planning on it which is really dumb i think we, oh is a creature coming in this one because they're going to uh, the wilderness this i keep is, forgetting I that this is actually like a, some kind of horror <clears throat> Supposedly. yeah okay like, i mean you got the, the you got the party of six, right? That's, that's a lot of meat for the for the creature. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, uh, uh, right, I'll, I'll, it's my turn again. We'll do a, we'll do a kind of, we'll take it in turns. Yay. Um, the six of them got their packs on their shoulders and headed up the mountain. <sighs> Samuel carried Jennifer's, went, what? Oh, Jennifer's whenever she started not feeling good. Is it a good idea to take someone who's pregnant up a mountain? Well, he doesn't know she's pregnant. Oh, right, yeah, know. sorry, that's me, no. yeah. Um, yeah, but she knows, doesn't she? She does, and she, for some reason, decided to hike up a mountain and tell him that she's pregnant, <laughs> even though she's not feeling well. Clearly, she's... That's a tough mountain, too. Not exactly, uh, just a trail going up. The snow is snowing as well. Like, so this mountain is full of, not all mountains have snow on them, but this one's got snow. She's pregnant and she's not feeling good. And they just thought, and they're about to bump into a monster. It's not fucking going well, this, is it? Sorry for yeah, the spoiler, Mark- but I assume they're going to bump into a monster because they're setting the scene for some kind of bizarre fucking, I can't wait to see what this creature is. Anyway. Dude, if, they, if, if the next paragraph is them coming home from this trip without bumping into the, to the monster, <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm going to sue Lon. <laughs> that's funny uh, the snow was getting deeper because of the altitude and the air was getting colder the higher up they went uh, they had they had thought about turning back and, but about turning and going back down the mountain but they decided they would bet be fine because they brought they brought extra with them in case they did have to camp out overnight they also brought a cell phone so they could... Call, what the fuck is he going on about? They brought a cell phone so they could call their parents and let them know that they were going... Uh, you didn't... Uh, they brought... Well, they didn't bring it to use as a doorstop, did they? They decided that it would be best to call... Stop and call their parents to let them know they would probably be camping out overnight on the mountain and would be back home tomorrow afternoon. After calling their parents, they continued on the way up the mountain. Uh, they all had to put the shoe snows on. Snowshoes, sorry. <laughs> shoe snow. Uh, <laughs> when they had stopped to call their parents because the snow was getting too deep for them to walk in without them. What? <sighs> I could just yeah. picture Lorne reading this shit. About 100 um, yards yeah. from where they had stopped to call their parents, they came upon a set of tracks. <laughs> I thought <laughs> <laughs> Come on, he's trying, man. He's trying. <laughs> oh, I thought the rage just said that it's like fucking Scooby Doo. This. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have got it away with it too right, for those pesky kids. Oh God. I thought the ranger, it's like there's always a ranger in Scooby-Doo, isn't there, and some kind of creature. Why didn't you know? give him the name? Bill Harlow. Bill Harlow told us this, not the ranger. You already named him, right? Is that his name, Bill? Bill Hawthorne. Yeah, ranger Bill Hawthorne. Hawthorne, sorry. Uh, I thought the ranger said that there were only ones... We were the only ones on the mountain today. What, you didn't think that there might be fucking animals on a mountain, like... You know, like on a fucking even mountain. even better. This is what he said. Even better, this, this pregnant woman is going up on a mountain with no one else on it. They all looked puzzled. Puzzled. They all looked puzzled until Andrew spoke up and said, "These tracks must have been made by the rangers today." And what kind of tracks are they? Like, what do you mean tracks? Could be anything. Fucking from a machine, a car, a boat. Well, not boat. Um. <sighs> they all agreed and continued on. He's talking about footprints. Yeah, but like tracks, footprints. They had a fairly he's easy being, time. He's being the country boy, um, bounty hunter, you know, but scout. But the thing is, if it's this you creature. Know, feeling the temperature of dung. Like, how could you mistake a creature's footprints for a. Never mind. Uh, they had a fairly easy time as they were hiking on the trail. But the higher up they got, the harder it was to keep track of where the trail was because there was less trees. <laughs> what is he going on about? It's 4.30 now, guys. We're a little over halfway up the mountain. I think we should stop camp here for the night so we can 
Still have some trees for shelter against the wind. Then we can start out. Who talks like this? Samuel suggested. The others agreed and set, started setting up their camps. Jennifer wasn't feeling good again, so Samuel gathered up some wood and started a fire so she could sit next to it and keep warm while he set up their tent. While they were setting up their tent, Vernon and Andrew came over to help. When I was getting wood for the fire, I saw more tracks that we seen that we saw earlier, he said. In, he said in a low tone to Vernon... And Andrew, so the girls wouldn't hear him. Why would the why would the tracks be all the way up here? It took us all day to climb this far, and we never stopped, noticed anyone following us. Andrew said, "I don't know, but we should be on lo- alert. We should be on alert just in case there's someone out here that the ranger didn't know about. What, like a serial killer?" The guys finished setting up the tents and joined the girls by the fire. After they had gotten warmed up a bit, Jennifer whispered to Samuel as he held his arms around her from behind, can we go in the tent and talk for a few minutes? There's something I need to tell you. Right, Amanda James, it's your turn now to read this (laughs) thing. Okay. Excuse us for a few, guys. Me and Jennifer need to talk about something. Samuel opened the tent Why? door for Jennifer to climb in first. <laughs> of course she did. Of course it did. Does that count? Does that count? It fucking certainly does. He's a perfect gentleman. Then he followed behind her and zipped it closed. Samuel sat in front of Jennifer and she took a hold of his hand. Are you feeling all right? He asked her with growing concern. Jennifer took a deep breath, looked into Samuel's eyes and said, I'm pregnant, Samuel. Samuel's face froze. An overwhelming feeling of excitement and happiness and scared to death ran through him all at one time. Uh... Samuel, say something, Jennifer said with a worried voice. A sigh of relief and a smile covered Jennifer's face at the same time as a tear rolled down her cheek when Samuel blurted out with a strong voice, I love you. (laughs) He He wrote it just like that, right? He said it just like that, yeah. He gave her a hug and a passionate kiss, then said, let's go outside and tell everyone. (laughs) Jennifer took his hand. Everyone knows but you, bro. They crawled back out of the tent. They sat back at the fire with their friends, and Samuel put both of his hands up and said, I have an announcement to make. Jennifer just informed me that around Thanksgiving time this year, she'll become a mother and me a father. (laughs) Their friends all came over and gave them a hug and congratulated them. As they were congratulating them, they heard some branches break in the woods. Did you hear that? Vernon asked the group. They all agreed that they had heard the noise, and each of the girls held tight to their boyfriends. It was probably just a deer or something like that, Andrew exclaimed. Just then, the cry of a coyote sounded and sent cold chills down everyone's spine. Once they recovered from the chill of the coyote cry... Andrew decided he'd better get some more wood before the fire went out completely. He grabbed a flashlight and took his turn to get the firewood. He didn't want to go too far from the campsite to get it because he didn't know what kind of animals he could run into, but he knew they wouldn't get too close to the fire. He went into the woods about 20 feet where he found a bunch of dry firewood thrown randomly between three trees. He bent over to get an armload of it and felt an odd feeling on his head, like something was dripping on it. He shook his head just in case he was imagining it. Then he felt the drip again. He turned his head to look up. His eyes opened wide when he moved the flashlight on it. He gasped for air, dropped the wood, and then let out a big scream. Back at the camp, they all looked at each other. You girls stay here at the fire, Samuel exclaimed. Samuel and Vernon went to see what Andrew had screamed for. When they reached him, they saw the look of fright on his face. Samuel shook him and asked, Andrew, Andrew, what's wrong? Andrew pointed up in the tree. Samuel and Vernon looked up in the tree and saw Ranger Ranger Bill Hawthorne hanging upside down with his stomach ripped out, but his arms turned torn off. Oh my God, Vernon exclaimed. We need to grab this wood and get back to the fire with the girls, Samuel said. (laughs) When they bent down to collect the wood, Vernon grabbed one of the Ranger's arms thinking it was a piece of wood. (laughs) When Andrew shined the light just right, 
Andrew noticed what it was. He dropped everything he was holding and turned and let his stomach loose. When he regained himself, he noticed the ranger's gun was still in the hand of the amputated arm. He reached down and pulled it out of the dead hand and picked up the wood he dropped, and they headed back to the campfire with the girls. Oh, my God. Um, okay, okay. Um, yeah, let's I, take can, can we come up for air right now? Yeah. Okay. So she announced that she's pregnant, and he's thrilled. Because that's what teenage boys think when they find out their girlfriend's pregnant. They're so excited. They can't wait. They want to tell everyone. They go out and congratulate all their, they they tell all their friends. And not one friend was like, dude, you're in high school. What? They're all, oh, congratulations. (laughs) You guys must be so proud and so happy. But anyway. I like the way you said said it. And she's going to be a mother. And I'm going to be a father. (laughs) Yeah, just in case they were confused about who the father was. Like. It's me, guys. And Lauren has never camped before. I mean, obviously, I mean, at least uh, not out, outside of campsites and things like that. I mean, the first thing you do is you gather wood before the night comes, and you just have a pile of it there, <laughs> and you don't confuse it with a ranger's arm. Well, that all escalated very quickly. One minute they were all happy and hugging and congratulating the happy new teenage parents, and. The next minute, there is Ranger Bill Hawthorne hanging from a tree with his stomach ripped out and his arms cut off. Why are they heading back to the campsite? Why aren't they heading back down the mountain? They well, they have to protect the girls. That above all, well, bring them need... with them. <laughs> I can assume they bring them with them. Well, you know. I think they can't hike down the mountain at night. Some okay, they have break. lights and whatnot, but that's yeah, okay. I mean, Just you go ahead and be hanging around there, would you? Floor. You wouldn't. You wouldn't go back and say, I know, let's t- let's not tell them about this mutilated body that we've seen and the fact that we need to take massive precautions to stop us coming to a grisly end. <clears throat> yeah. No, they're just okay. going to camp there. They're going to wait till the morning and hope that whatever ripped out the ranger's stomach and ripped his arms off doesn't come to do the same for them. It sounds like alien, oh, not alien predator. Which yeah, I was right? I was thinking that actually. <clears throat> it does it does seem like that. Uh we don't need to Well at least is you know, the reason I was kinda of saying that it seems silly not to tell them, but his reasoning here is that um I'm skipping ahead here, is that you know, we don't need to be upset because I don't want Jennifer to lose the baby because she's gonna just be frightened, of course. Um do you wanna read this? Don't they have a bit? cell phone? They do, yes. He went into great detail about why they needed one as well. <clears throat> oh. Okay, there's a murder. <laughs> it's it's kind of... You yeah, don't want to just you're not going to use the cell phone in that situation, it kind of doesn't seem to be any point bringing one. Yeah, well, you don't, don't want to use it all on stuff like that. You want to be able to talk to your precious princess. Mm. Right. Yeah, it doesn't run out of minutes. Do you want to uh, go forth? It's your turn. It's you, Shin. Yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> they agreed to keep what they saw to themselves for now. They can continue back to the fire with the girls. What did Andrew scream so loud for? What a weird... Okay, never mind. Holly asked. He saw a dead raccoon and it scared him. <laughs> and replied. <laughs> the three young men all looked at each other and wondered what... What could have possibly killed a ranger in such a manner as that? After all, the ranger was about six foot three inches tall and weighed at least 275 pounds. That's pretty fat, actually. <laughs> Samuel walked over to Jennifer and sat down beside, behind her and placed his hand over, under her jacket and over, over her belly as if to hold her and their unborn baby at the same time. Okay. She leaned her head back and rested on his shoulders and whispered, I love you, yeah. in his ear. Kissed her on the cheek and whispered, I love you too, back to her. And then went back to thinking about the ranger again. <laughs> so is it erotic. There's a dead guy hanging up over there. After about 15 minutes, <laughs> he wrote a poem. I, that's all I got. I can't <laughs> yeah. see anymore. <laughs> you got to scroll up. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Dude? Yep. 
Uh, still waiting for it to come in. Let me go check out. Oh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> Where am I? Uh, about fi- about 15 minutes of silence. Andrew got up to put more wood on the fire. Whitney got up and walked over to Andrew and whispered, I need to go to the ladies' room. Will you come with me? What? Is Whitney a guy or a girl, guys? Whitney's a girl. Oh, oh Andrew is. I'm sorry. Andrew is Andrew, her boyfriend. And you yeah. go, Will you come with me? Andrew grabbed the flashlight and let Samuel and Vernon know that he's going to take uh, Whitney to the bathroom. Whitney grabbed Andrew's hand and pulled him uh, pulled on him to hurry him more. Andrew let let her to a different part of the woods, away from where they found the ranger. Should have let her be right there. Andrew stood about fifteen feet away from Whitney while she went to the bathroom. While he was did... waiting for her to finish. Hmm. No, sorry, go on. What? It's just convenient that there's a bathroom okay. on the mountain. Uh, Andrew stood about 15 feet away from Whitney while she was... No, there's no she bathroom. went to the bathroom. Uh, while he was waiting for her to finish, he started moving his flashlight around on the ground. Then he noticed something in the snow while moving his flashlight around the well, scene. Well, yeah, she's just Tra- done a turd. Of course there's something in the fucking... Jesus. <laughs> that uh, scene earlier that day. Then Andrew heard a sharp grunt coming from Whitney's direction. He called her name. Whitney, are you all right? He asked. No answer. Oh, she's dead. Uh-oh. <laughs> Came from Whitney. Andrew started walking over... Andrew started walking over to where he left Whitney to use the bath. What is he? Okay, use the bathroom. Uh, I'm going to the so, same page. Uh, right, let's just have a quick stop here. Right, of yeah. course, she needs to let rip, which we all do from time to time. But I don't think that leaving her on her own, out of sight, at any at this when there's this monster on the loose, was a good idea, was it? Right, I'm going to have to start. I did say at the beginning I wasn't going to rip holes into this thing, but I I can't really help it. Well, he said she was about 15 feet away. Mm. How could he not see her? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, did he just turn around and then when he turned back, she'd gone? But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's the least. That's the least of this thing's problems. It's, mm-hmm. The plot holes are also almost as ridiculous as the Obi Wan series, but we'll uh, we'll carry on. <clears throat> his romantic scenes are much better than his action scenes. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, um, okay, Whitney, are you all right? He asked. No answer came from Whitney. Andrew started walking over to where he left Whitney to use the bathroom. There was no sign of Whitney, and no sign that she had moved from that spot. Just then, Andrew was knocked to the ground from something that fell out of the tree. He was. Under, uh, under, I assume. Sorry, I don't know. Um, and then he asked, Andrew pushed Whitney off of him. Okay. To tell her never do that again to him. We missed something? Okay. Andrew yeah, pushed I'm Whitney a bit off. Confused of him. There. Well, I don't know if never... I have, I don't know if I accidentally deleted it or something, but apparently Whitney, I remember when typing it, Whitney had like climbed a tree and jumped out of the tree onto Andrew and knocked him down on the ground. Oh, right. That might be me doing a bad copy and paste job, so I apologise. We can fill in the blanks. It makes it kind of exciting, or at least that's what I'm running with. So that so, so Whitney's bit... not dead? No, Whitney's not dead. She was playing a prank on him by climbing a tree and jumping that's out of oh, it. And I've and we've conveniently missed that part out. Sorry, guys. Lorne was trying to build up a bit of suspense, and I've just blown it with my bad copy and paste job. No, it's okay. We got. It's not like we missed a lot. No, definitely. I mean, again, it, this is another tease of the creature. Nothing, you know, nothing happened. It's just a cheap jump scare. You know, Whitney's fine. Uh, Andrew pushed Whitney off of him and told her to never do that to him again. I don't know if he's still there, guys. Can you um just let me know if we're still live? I think I managed to jump back actually. Um, I managed to jump on next door's um, internet problem. Yeah, with I think we're still live though. Actually, I think I managed to just jump back. Yeah, we just, are. just I managed to avoid catastrophe there, which is quite impressive, really. Because um, I'm giving myself a bit of credit. My internet's gone down, and before the stream completely went, I jumped back on next door. So. People send me money because that was great. Um, 
next doors will go down now. That'll be fantastic. Um, so you anyway. probably went down as at the same time everybody else went down. What part did you hear last? Um, so basically, where Whitney is um, in the um, jumping on him, playing that silly prank. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, see, I almost want here. to give a synopsis. <laughs> okay. Can you still see the screen, Andrew, because I can't see it. Oh right, we're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to share the screen with you. Um, yeah, just just one second. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to do some mauling around now. Just bear with me. Uh, okay. Do... Well, I'll catch you up. The last thing you heard was Whitney jumping out of the tree on Andrew. He yelled at her and said, don't ever do that again. And then he said, hurry up. And there was no answer. So he turned around and she wasn't there anymore. So he shined his flashlight uh, on the snow, I assume. And there, all he saw were tracks leading away from him with a trail of blood. So Whitney has been abducted or right. something. Okay. And then he went back to the campsite to tell everyone what he saw, which is, I mm -hmm. guess, 15 feet away. I don't know where, why anybody else couldn't hear, heard everything. Right. And, and, and he had to tell the girls for the first time what was going on. And they want to go About home. He said, Ranger we can't and... now. If we leave now at night, we'll have less of a chance of making it out alive than if we stay here on this mountain with a killer creature nearby until morning. How does he figure that? I don't get it. Great questions. Hmm. I mean, are they are they armed? Well, they got the the Rangers gun now. Right. They do. Okay. I can't even believe we're falling into the story like this. <laughs> well, we've got to, haven't we? It's part of our job. Um, we've got to at least, you know, follow the narrative. Yeah. There is one. Um, right. I'll carry on from here. So, I'll just read from. So there was no reply from Whitney. Andrew turned around upset and said, Whitney, I told you not to rest around with me like that. Now get over here. When he moved his flashlight across the snow, looking for it, uh, looking for Whitney, all she, all he saw were prints going away with a blood trail following them. Andrew schemed out, Whitney! He ran back to the camp and told the others what happened. They had no choice but to tell the other girls what they had found when they went to get the wood. The girls wanted to go home. There's no way we can go home right now, Samuel said. If we leave right now, then we're going to have less of a chance of making it out alive than we would if we waited and we if we wait until daylight. They all agreed they would wait for daylight, then head back down the mountain. It's really hard to read this as well. I'm, it, it's such a bizarre... Anyway, Andrew Vernon and myself should take turns staying up and keeping the fire going tonight and you girls get some rest. Andrew said. Jennifer and Holly laid down, both crying from the loss of Whitney and the fear they had for themselves and the guys. This is so what about, shit. What about Andrew? Why isn't Andrew heartbroken, man? Andrew's a bastard. You heard it here. <laughs> um, Samuel went to Jennifer and embraced her. It's going to be all right, he said. I'm going to protect you and our baby. Jennifer held him tight and kissed him on the lips as a tear fell from her eye. So tragic, this, isn't it? Everything was so going so well. They had this beautiful relationship, as far as we know. Baby's coming. And as luck would have it, a ravenous monster's on the loose and he's killing people and they're caught in it. It's such a terrible situation. Uh, Samuel went back to the fire with Andrew and Vernon. We have the ranger's gun and the flare gun, so we have a defense against the animal that has done this. But that one defense might not be enough. What uh, one defense? He got a gun and a flare gun. Um, Samuel exclaimed. Then what else are we going to do? Vernon asked. We know the animal will not come near the fire, so we're going to build the fire up more to keep it at a distance. Samuel explained. Andrew, come with me and get more wood, and Vernon can stay here with the girls and the fire, Samuel said. <sighs> right, I think it's your turn, Amanda James. I don't think we've got long left. Can you carry on? Please? Yeah. 
we're going back to where we saw the ranger to get the wood because it was dry and it will burn easier and hotter, Samuel explained. When they got there, they looked up at the ranger again. Look on his belt, Andrew said. We could use that knife. Andrew climbed up the branch where the ranger was and took the knife off of the ranger. He then jumped back down, filled his arms with wood, and they headed back to the fire. 